Welcome to another episode of the Managing Happiness Show, where we interview successful entrepreneurs on how they manage to have a happy family life while dealing with the madness of entrepreneurship. I'm David Hensley, your host, and today's guest is Dan Golden, who is a veteran digital marketing executive and speaker. Dan is um, the co-founder of the digital agency Be Found Online, which is a full-service performance digital media agency. Dan is a rock star in his field. He's been featured in Forbes, Huffington Post, Search Engine Journal, Mashable, etc., etc. You name it. And he even taught the Google um, agency training program. And he's a fellow YC member. This is how we've met. And I'm super excited to have him on the show. It's actually our second show. We had some technical difficulties after the earthquake that happened here in Bodrum. My internet connection was slightly unstable. So thank you very much for taking the time and being on the show again. I appreciate it. Glad, glad to be here. Times two. Look forward to our, uh, our discussion. Yep. No earthquakes this time. So fingers crossed. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where are you located again? Uh, I'm in Chicago. We're on the north side of the city, close to Wrigley Field. I both, uh, I live about a mile away from the office and uh, that's, um, we're, we're in a neighborhood instead of downtown, which, uh, which I love. And a lot of our team is, is, is a big fan of. Nice. Nice. It's awesome. So also no hurricanes, so no natural catastrophes on, on this uh, episode. We, so. we, we only have one natural catastrophe and that is winter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. it's only, it only, it only lasts for about seven months <laughs> and uh, we dig ourselves out and you know that uh, Chicago is the best city in the world in the summer. So we, we pack in a year's worth of, uh, of, of everything in the, in the three mm. months of, of warm and happy. Yeah, well, it it's, has, you know, you always have to see it from the bright side. You can get a lot of work done in the winter because you can't do anything, right? So it's... <laughs> Very true. Very true. Yeah. <laughs> so but we do, I mean, you, we do a lot to take advantage of the weather when it's good. We have half day Fridays, which is uh, kind of a standard amongst ad agencies in Chicago. And um, there's something happening every night. So we, we really do live by that and pack it in during the time that we have. Nice. You know, that's all you can do. Yeah, we, we also had summer Fridays in LA where we gave off half the half a day uh, for you know so people could could leave and have a long weekend. Uh, everybody, well, you guys, you guys are just being greedy <laughs> in LA. <laughs> <laughs> you get the nice weather and summer Fridays, and now I gotta now I have to up my game. <laughs> um, talking about upping your game, you, I just discovered while chatting with you before the call that you're implementing EOS. Um, in, in the business, that's really exciting. I want to talk about this in, in a minute. It's really excited about because I, I think it's 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 really amazing. And also, EOS helped me to shape the Managing Happiness course because it's kind of the same thing: applying business principles in your family, you know. And like EOS teaches you these fundamentals of your, your business, carves them out, your mission, vision, values, and kind of what you want to accomplish. So it's very similar to the Managing Happiness course. So. Excited to talk to you about this, but um, starting out, why did you start your business? Why do you do what you do? Uh, you know, I'm I come from a family of entrepreneurs. I, you know, I when I started the business, it was a side gig. My uh, not the nine to five, but the the six to midnight mm -hmm. shift. Um, so you know, I I found as with everything we've done here, I sort of found a found a niche and found some demand and followed it. Um, you know, I, I, I probably had some grandiose visions about how easy it would be to create some recurring revenue on the side, um, not fully grasping the complexities of the sales force I would need and customer service and actually all, all the stuff, right? So um, I learned up, uh, you know, I was working for largest search agency in the country. We got acquired by DoubleClick and Google um, before I uh, jumped ship and started BFO in earnest. Um, but it was something I always knew I, uh, I had in me and something I wanted to do. And, um, you know, I found demand and, and followed it. I mean, that's, um, I didn't sit down with a business plan and decide to sign up for a commercial lease and, and get things started. I, you know, found, found some skills, found a niche and, uh, and went after it, you know, follow, follow the food at, at every step. And, um, the company's kind of evolved in our focus based on, based on that mentality of just finding opportunities and, and going for it. And um, how big's your organization today? Uh, so we have, we have about uh, 40 full timers in the U S about 25% of our, uh, our employees are, are, are remote. 
Um, we've got an office in London with 20 people and, uh, and one person in, in Singapore. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we've got a kind of an army of contractors and writers that we work with as, uh, as well as demand kind of scales. So mm-hmm. we're, um, I, I like to say the perfect size We're uh, we're big enough to matter. Um, we can hang with enterprise accounts, uh, starting to see some of the growing pains of scaling and, and trying to get in front of that and address those, uh, those issues Hence before US. they become problems. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that's the uh, that's kind of what we've shaped into, and uh, still see a lot of room for uh, for growth in a bunch of areas as we've kind of branched out from our core offering and uh, and now do a lot of other other stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of growth, we had our uh, let's see. I know you and I are on video conference. Uh, this won't come through in a podcast, but uh, we celebrated our sixth year in a row on the Inc. Five Thousand list with uh, custom six packs of uh, old style beer. That's um, awesome. Congratulations. <laughs> I saw it on Facebook. That's really cool. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You've also been um, uh, in, 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 on the Inc. 5000 list for the best place to work, right? Uh, that was at, uh, at Age. Was number, at yeah, num- number one best agency to work for last year. Um, mm-hmm. Of every kind of honor and piece of recognition, that one, that one certainly means the most to me. Mm-hmm. Um, building a place that people uh, can be fulfilled at. Um, and it's, it's hard to do. And especially in our space as a marketing services firm, um, you know, there is, uh, there's a challenge at every turn, whether it's scope or a thousand other agencies trying to undercut us on price, uh, demanding clients, um, changing every time Google makes an update, we got to change <laughs> what we, what, what we do. It's a, uh, you know, it's a tough, um, tough okay. task that, Keyword that I have and that our team anymore. has. Yeah, keyword stuffing has not worked for a while. You know, I, I you know, I think a lot of <laughs> a lot of the best practices. You know, here's here's what I say about um, about that is like Google's been saying the same thing for the last 15 years of becoming an authority and creating relevant content for humans. Mm-hmm. Every one of these little algorithm updates is just Google getting better at fulfilling on that vision. Mm-hmm. So there's there's plenty of best practices. Uh, that you know aren't aren't just the uh, the tactic du jour um, that that do have you know lasting impact, um, and a lot of what we do is just saying no to crap like that, mm. and uh, you know clients come to us oftentimes to to clean up the mess from other agencies or with some scheme about how they can get all these links and we have to talk them off the ledge and uh, <laughs> show them the right uh, sometimes way slower way to do things. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's about people first, right? As Google says, and you also have people first seeing that that age made you the best place to work at. Um, how do you do it? Do you have core values that you live? Yeah, I mean, we, we have the value statements on the wall. We've got, um, you know, we practice open book management. Uh, actually, most of my executive team is at the Gathering of the Games, which is a, a conference for the great game of business, uh, which is a style of open book management that we practice. Can you explain um, open book management for the audience? Yeah, I mean, it means, it means a lot of different ways, uh, a lot of different things to different companies. Um, the way we approach it, and uh, a lot of that is learned from some great, you know, some great mentors, is, is less about, you know, I work for a company where every quarter they would show the financials and the EBITDA and um, it never meant anything to me. I was like, you know, it felt very disconnected from those numbers. Uh, and the way that we look at it is we want everybody at our company to feel like and act like owners. So it's less about, um, so we're very transparent, uh, you know, through the good times and the challenging times. Um, and it's less so about, here's what we did, let's pat ourselves on the back, um, but more about looking forward. So we're, you know, fanatical about projecting out the next month and the next quarter and breaking that down into really tangible, tangible things that any person here can affect. So our cost of goods sold, we talk about that. We talk about what the expenses are, um, you know, where, where literally as we're going through line items of uh, expenses, like everybody here knows how to read a balance sheet. So, mm-hmm. you know, doing fewer fancy client dinners and being judicious in our travel schedule and expenses and, you know, we had a, um, so we've, we've done stuff where we like tie bonuses to, um, to you know, to company performance uh, on a quarter. And um, we presented, look, we've got a $20,000 gap. We either have to make that up with new revenue or cut expenses. Uh, and a 22 year old is looking at that and, and says, you know, we're paying 500 bucks a month to license this tool. 
why don't we, you know, I could have our team in Belize execute on that and we'll save 12 grand a year. Mm -hmm. um, so we, you know, kind of foster that. So everybody, everybody feels like an owner and everybody can speak up and, and, and have a stake in the outcome. Yeah, we, we did the same thing. We were always super transparent in terms of numbers, the good, bad, and the ugly. Like just, you know, m makes life much easier if you don't have to hide anything, if you can just like, you All know. Right. Well, and it's, you know, I'm, I don't want to be greedy. I want, I want people to share in the pain of being a business owner. So, you know, <laughs> we've, had, we've had our great years and, you know, earlier this year was a really challenging time. We fired one of our biggest clients uh, for being awful to our humans. And hmm. that put us in a real that's financial ball. crunch. That's <laughs> ball, ball scene. That's awesome. That's also why it, the best yeah. thing to work at, right? And um, in the long run, it's, uh, it's, it's the right thing to do. It, it is. It, uh, you know, everybody I talk to, it's, it'll be the scariest thing you do and you're so happy. And I'm like, I, you'll be so happy. It'll be the best thing ever. And I'm like, I get it. I'm in scary mode. Um, but we, you know, we, we shared with the team, like, here's the cliff. Here's the fiscal cliff in three months if we don't make some drastic changes in terms of winning new business and cutting costs. Um, so we, you know, we did a, an all day appreciative inquiry session, um, trying to, you know, getting everybody brainstorming, you know, we, again, having 22 year olds who've been working here for six months on a team of, of volunteers on how do we cut, you know, how do we save on salaries and benefits without firing people without mm -hmm. losing, you know, humans first, what do we do? Um, and they came up with a lot of things, you know, we froze raises for, for a period of time, um, you know, when we, when we got, and we had a best first half of the year we've ever had actually. Um, so the first thing we did was unfreeze raises and get back pay and that kind of stuff. But, you know, if it's the owner of a company coming in a room saying, we're going to do this to you, yeah, uh, very, versus, very thing, yeah. <laughs> it's very different. Yeah. That's awesome. I really like that. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry that you, you had to struggle, but I think it's 100% the right, the right way of, of doing this. We, I was in this position as well when we we had a lot of live streaming customers that we we didn't we never want to do live streaming but there's was a lot of demand and then we took a lot of these live streaming customers on and we found that these are really bad clients that were really not made for this and took a ton of ton of time of our engineering team and support team etc and then at some point we just said okay we're just gonna fire all these clients which was scary and like sales was not happy about this, but in the long run, this was definitely the right, the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit of, about EOS and um, maybe you can explain what EOS is and what you plan on doing sure. with it. Sure. I mean, it's the, the entrepreneur's operating system. I'm staring at, uh, staring at traction. Again, uh, <laughs> David's on video conference. He can see the book. Um, you know, we tried to self-implement. We had, uh, you know, we had a chapter a week with our management team. Um, it's just a, it's a methodology. You know, I, I think it was summarized best by someone I talked to who discovered EOS, you know, 15 years into running a business. And it's basically like everything we spent 15 years fine-tuning and trying to do about how we operate uh, is basically summarized in this book. Um, so it's a very practical approach to how to manage a business that is, uh, you know, with, with the entrepreneurs involved. If anything, it's therapy for the business owners and uh, <laughs> providing a framework for, uh, for guys like me to give things away and to put more trust in, 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 in the processes, uh, but also adding a layer of accountability, which makes giving things away a lot easier um, if there's more transparency and accountability for, for the things that, you know, that you're trusting your team with. Um, so, you know, the, every, there's tons of great books out there that inspire different ways of thinking about business. Um, I would say EOS and the book traction is more of an actual process or an actual blueprint on how to run any kind of business. Um, and so there's, you know, there's some things in that that work really well for us. Some things that, you know, you ha kind of have to take and adapt to what you know will work within your organization. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, really excited. Uh, one business day away from our, our first paid session with an implementer. Nice. Um, so yeah, we're about to get to it. So now, since you know EOS and managing happiness is very similar to EOS, just applying these oh, best practices or just like logical things to your family like what can you see overlapping? Like what do you think makes sense to take from the EOS or from the business model and apply it to your personal life? And what do you maybe, what are you maybe already doing? 
Yeah, I mean, I would say the like transparency, collaboration, and measurement of uh, you know different initiatives. I, I'm I guess I'm having trouble making like a direct bridge between a specific chapter in EOS uh, or a specific chapter in the book and and family life, but you know you you what are the what are the things that get in the way? You know, it's communication. Communication is a, the root of all. Uh, you know, I guess that's a grandiose statement, but uh, I think you know one of the key factors in in uh, family and uh, home home issues. So that's that's one thing I think. Um, you know, whether it's from EOS or any of the any of the business collaboration tools. Um, you know, communicating schedules, communicating needs and wants. Uh, you know that that misalignment seems to be the root of uh, a lot of a lot of struggles, especially with um, you know every every nowadays everybody's life is is overscheduled, and I you know I'm I'm running from taking care of the kiddos, getting them breakfast in the morning, getting them ready to get out the door while my wife is getting ready for the day. Um, at work, book back to back for the next twelve you know eight to twelve hours running home in time, you know, we're, we're all over scheduled. Um, so to add, uh, anything on top of that is, is usually, um, usually the first to go and, um, making time to prioritize, uh, prioritize the home time and, and building, you know, building that in, you have to manage that like you do, a you know, a presentation that's due or, a or a report that has to go out. You know, if you, if you're, um, it can't be get all your work done. And then, you know, that's, that's one thing that's worked for me is um, I, I don't try and balance the two. Like it's, if, if I, if I got all my work done before I went home to pay attention to my kids, like I would never see them. So it's, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> you got to prioritize the things that matter at the, you know, at the same level as, you know, as, as keeping the lights on with, with business. Cause if, uh, if your home life's miserable, um, you're going to be a bad boss and, not do great work for your clients and all that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you have one, one calendar where you schedule your, do you schedule family time in your calendar? Do you block stuff out? Say, Hey, yeah. Um, so I do it. Yeah. So I do in, so I do in some ways. I'm not as regimented as I preach. Um, but I find a way to make that happen. Um, you know, bedtime is something that's very important to me. Like if there's, if there's a dinner or we're hosting an event or I'm speaking somewhere, like I, you know, I go and do it. Um, but I always make time to get, uh, to get home for home for dinner and home to put the kids down. Um, even if that means starting at 8 PM, I'm, you know, back in the office or back on the couch working, uh, until I fall asleep, which is often the case. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's, uh, so I have like a, I, have, I use schedule once same, same thing as like doodle or Calendly that mm -hmm. a lot of folks use. Um, and I certainly like block off that time for, uh, to make sure I can get out of here in time. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I do a lot of networking and happy hours, uh, and I start that at four o'clock, uh, and say, you know, I got to get out of here by six fifteen. Mm -hmm. So putting a, putting a cap on a lot of those, those events that very easily could take, um, you know, take me All out evening. for, uh, for an evening. Um, and then in the, you know, in the morning, I don't schedule meetings before 9am cause I'm with the, with the kids. So, mm -hmm. um, and again, there's exceptions here and there, but uh, for me, it's all about making the rule. Um, you know, the for me, the exception can't be when I get to see family, right? That's got to be the rule. Yep. Is building in that balance, and then if there's a week where it's busy, or you know, an evening I have to be out, there's like a there, you know, there's an understanding there, and um, and <laughs> there I found it's all about communication, right? So uh, if she knows in advance that I'm out tonight, uh, she can plan for it. It's in her like. Uh, it's okay um, yep. <laughs> when it's last minute and she's had a long stressful day and is relying on me to uh, for something and I you know back out at the last minute um, if it's communicated right that can still be okay but uh, you know it's trying to uh, avoid those situations and um, learning from the uh, learn from the lumps you've taken as uh, <laughs> as you try and balance entrepreneurship with uh, being a husband and a father I think, um, first of all, I 100% agree. Like, there's nothing that aggravates my wife more than when I come to her and say, hey, I'm flying to blah, blah, blah tomorrow. Like, she loses it. 
versus if I tell her in advance, I can be gone for two weeks and she's fine with it. You know, it's like it's it's very funny how how that works. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, with uh, I, I think uh, who told me? Mm, I forgot where I heard, heard it, where I heard it first. It's uh, work life integration. No, work life balance is a bad word. You should never even think yeah. about the balance because you can't balance. You have to integrate it and make it like uh, one. Yeah, one thing. yeah. No, I yeah, I do that as well. I mean, it's uh, right. I I don't have like personal email and work email or personal calendar and work calendar. Um, it's all you know. There's there's really only one me. Um, yeah. you know, I think, uh, you have to be really good at compartmentalizing when you're with your family. Uh, and frankly, like, you know, that's, that's easy when I get, you know, when I get home and my three-year-old is ready to play, he doesn't give a shit how busy I am or the presentation I'm ready, waiting for tomorrow. <laughs> like it is, uh, um, you know, I, that's, uh, I mean, to me, that's, that's helpful. Like I, I, uh, they, they, you know, arguably before I had kids, I didn't really, uh, it was really tough to unplug. And now, you know, during the time I have with them, like, you gotta. <laughs> Dude, um, I just interviewed somebody and we talked about like be being a better entrepreneur because of having kids. Can you yeah. agree to that? Yeah. I mean, you know, the forced uh, patience, um, <laughs> the, uh, I've, I've certainly increased my, my capacity to be, you know, to be patient, to deal with maddening situations. Um, kids certainly train, you know, force you, force you into that. Um, <laughs> you know, certainly like it's, I don't know, sometimes, sometimes I'm on client calls and it feels just as, it feels about the same as uh, holding a screaming baby who's, you know, who's sick and teething at 3 a.m., you know, for two hours, you know, it's, do you, do you want to call out a few clients, <laughs> <laughs> you know who you are and you're probably not listening to this podcast. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's, I, there's, a, there's a lot of parallels there. Um, you know, and certainly, you know, staying organized and staying efficient in, in how you use your time, hmm. kids force you into that. Like it, you know, when I, um, and again, I have a, uh, some luxuries that I will fully acknowledge. You know, my, um, my lovely wife has decided to stay home with our kids for, for now. She was a very accomplished lawyer. Um, and that, you know, that enables me to do a lot of what I do. Um, you know, when I, when, when kid number one arrived, uh, I stayed home for six weeks. Um, you know, I, I, uh, that being said, you know, in terms of this like balance and integration thing, you know, I saw, I saw a lot of, um, uh, a lot of dads that get that two weeks off and they would take the two weeks and, and sit there on the couch watching TV while a baby slept. And then two weeks later, you're back full time. Um, and that like, you know, that didn't make, that doesn't make sense. That that's not as helpful. Um, and I know all of them don't, uh, but new kids, you know, babies sleep a lot. So during that downtime, I stayed on top of shit. I had, uh, you know, I had zero inbox for that first six weeks. I've never had that. Um, cause I, you know, I used the time during those breaks. I was, you know, um, but I took myself off of calls and recurring meetings and getting in front of clients. Um, and I found when I came back, I didn't have to just keep, you know, restart doing everything that I was doing before. Uh, and that's something that I think is, um, is helpful for any entrepreneur to, yeah, you know, to step just, back. Not even having kids, but even when, when I go on vacation, I still stay on top of stuff. Like I, I make sure that my email doesn't get out of control because otherwise, you know, the relaxing vacation will be gone if I come back to like horror in, in the office, right? Yeah. So I, have to be, I think it's, it's good. Yeah. Thing. I mean, I, and I'm like, you know, I find myself less stressed out. Um, when I know stuff's taken care of, because sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes I'm the one that gets the email. And if I hit forward on Monday night at 2 a.m. when I'm checking it while on vacation and have someone on my team addressing it, um, that's great. If I waited a week, uh, then I'm going to come back to a, you know, uh, to a shit storm. And, and so, yeah, it's certainly um, uh, a certain level of checking in and, and staying on top of stuff can actually make, you know, make things less stressful than, um, than fully unplugging. 
Um, that being said, last week I went to Burning Man for the first time in seven years and fully unplugged from everything other than checking text messages for, uh, for emergencies, which luckily there weren't. Um, awesome. it's, it's on yeah. my bucket list. I have never found the time to go. And It'll, it, uh, find, find the time. I mean, it's not for everybody, uh, but it is, um, it's worth it'll never be cheap it'll never be easy or convenient or comfortable um and that uh i think that level of discomfort makes keeps it what it is um and that you know that a good lesson to take from that uh is you know so you know leaving a, a wife and two small kids at home so i can gallivant about the desert um certainly is a is a lot to ask and um I'm very proud of the way I engineered that, and <laughs> it, uh, it worked for everybody. We did a, you know, we flew down to um, to Scottsdale, where her family's from, mm -hmm. and had a nice weekend uh, with the in-laws, and she stayed there and had, you know, her mom and grandmother and high school Some friends support. to, yeah, full, you know, full level of support um, that allowed me to go get silly in the in the dust for for six days, um, and that's part of it, just you know, making sure finding a way to, um, you know, and that, so that's like an egregious example of, uh, you know, a high level of freedom and fun that I get to have, but same thing for, you know, leaving it's, to speak at a, speak at a conference, right? It's, um, it, it's, it's very much managing happiness. The, the actual concept of it, of making sure you manage this and that you don't, you know, like upset your wife and did you just like plan it out in advance? How can you make it as, convenient as possible for everybody involved that you know everybody's happy how how do you communicate it properly etc it's like really pure pure management uh, yeah and some and some of it is just you know what i think works for for us in my relationship is you know a, an acknowledgement that uh it's not tit for tat or that um you know uh it's not fair and she knows it's not fair that i get to go out and entertain clients and I need to, you know, I'm, I'm in South Florida a lot during the winter staying with clients and entertaining people and going to the beach, going to a bar at the beach. You know, it's, uh, it's great networking. Um, my company makes money every time I do that. Mm. Uh, and that, you know, that, uh, brings home the Turkey bacon as we call it. Um, <laughs> that was a little, little side note on the bringing home the Turkey bacon. I happen to not eat mammals. So we, we only have Turkey bacon at home and, uh -huh. Um, that was sort of the, you know, bringing home the turkey bacon was something we would say in front of my then two year old. And, uh, I was, it was a Saturday morning and I was getting him turkey bacon for breakfast. And, uh, he just looked at me and he said, dad, dad no, no turkey bacon. No, you don't go work. Um, <laughs> to, I, I could understand how a two year old brain wouldn't fully, uh, wouldn't get the difference between bringing home the turkey bacon and eating turkey bacon and, that meaning that daddy's going to leave for the day. Um, that was heartbreaking, but uh, good to know he wants me around. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, 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 it's tough to how do you communicate this to your kids that you, know, you, you love being around them. And I just interviewed somebody, uh, a female entrepreneur, and she, you know, looking back at her mom, who was like 100% full-time with the kids, she had a really hard time to how do you explain your kid that, you know, you do other stuff. You have to work, you have to travel, you have to do all these things that you're a multifaceted being and that, you know, you, you still love them and they're, you're, they're your number one priority, but you still have to do this other stuff and how you communicate this. It's, uh, yeah. Not, not, right. Not, like I, <laughs> yeah, I know. Like you're, the reason you have this house is because daddy is staring at that computer and talking on the phone. Like it doesn't, uh, you know, with our line of work, it's, yes, it's very, you know, it's abstract um, or an abstract con concept to a two-year-old mind. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. We just, uh, I, I use repetition. You just kind of say the same thing over and over again and explain sort of, you know, this is how it is. Uh, you know, I, I work from home at least one day a week. Um, but, uh, you know, when I'm in the basement and he can't be down there playing guitar with me, it's, uh, got to explain that as well. You know, I'm, <laughs> um, and occasionally I can keep him busy enough that I could actually do real work, uh, while we're hanging out, but, um, they require a lot of maintenance. 
<laughs> oh, didn't did you were you in a band before? I was. Well, that was. Yeah, uh, we talked about last time, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's how I got into this whole mess, this digital marketing thing. I was touring with uh, toured with my college band for a couple of years, and uh, internet marketing was my little side gig. Um, and then the band broke up, and I got a full time day job, and the rest is uh, rest is history. But yeah, it was between working at a cigar store or taking a search engine marketing internship, uh, like a month after Google launched AdWords. Um, so I, I think I picked the right thing. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. You know, last time we talked about that, you know, back in the days, it was the cool thing for kids. Everybody wants to become a rock star, you know, become fam rich and famous by, by being a rock star. And these days, all the kids want to become entrepreneurs and build an app and you know, become the next Steve Jobs. Like, you know, kind of like the, uh, it's, we're the, the, the nerd rock stars now, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, there is, you know, if you want to give credit to, you know, Shark Tank and some TV shows that have, uh, I mean, I think that the wheels have been motion in motion for a long time. But yeah, there's a, uh, you know, I think an over glorification of entrepreneurship and um, what it is. There, there was a, uh, um, I was getting my wife some flowers. Uh, which is another recommendation to all you entrepreneurs out there. Um, not just on birthdays, every once in a while, keep them on their toes. Um, <laughs> I, know she's gonna I know she's going to listen to this. I love you, honey. Um, <laughs> but there, there was a sign on the wall that said like, uh, I'm going to paraphrase this incorrectly, but it's, it's, it's much wittier than I'm what I'm paraphrasing here. But it's like, there's nothing more overrated than or the only thing more overrated than natural childbirth is owning your own business. Um, and that, you know, there's, uh, you know, for every great moment of, uh, you know, every award that we win, uh, there's, there's a night of sleep that you lose. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not an easy path. Same with touring with the band. You know, I, my band had some great gigs. We, you know, we opened for Umphreys mm -hmm. McGee and the average white band and headline the house of blues, Chicago almost sold it out. Um, so for every one of those, there's a Thursday night in Cleveland where the band outnumbers the bartenders who's your entire <laughs> crowd uh, and you get to sleep in a $25 a night hotel room with six of your best friends. Like there's, um, there's, there's yep. glamour in all of this, but there's a lot of grunt work and um, you the know, ent a lot entrepreneurial of roller coaster. Yay. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I would not. I'm I'm very happy that I chose this path. I uh, I can't even imagine doing anything else. So it's it's treated me well. But yeah, not yeah. not for everyone. You need to be yeah have a how do you call this? Strong nerves and a strong gut to, you know, deal deal with a lot of stress and pressure. Talking about this, any hacks on dealing with stress and pressure? How do you what do you do? Any habits that help you withstand um, it? Um yeah. Uh I mean, hanging out with the kids forces you into it. Uh, I love playing music. That's certainly anything that you can focus on that, you know, that enables you to, to unplug and take your mind off of it. Um, I, th I feel like I have an, an I, if I could bottle this up, I would write a book about it, but I don't, um, I don't quite know what it is, but um, I seem to do well taking punches and uh, figuratively, I don't really get in fights. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, stressful situations and taking a deep breath, reminding everybody it's going to be fine and talking about outcomes instead of problems. Like I, I'm, uh, I'm, I feel like I'm built for that. Um, now the, the downside of that is, uh, I get to deal with everybody's problems. Um, that's sort of the, you know, <laughs> the, the role of the owner. You can sort of tell when someone walks into your office, like you're, you know, I know the look on your face. Let me have it. Let's deal with it. Um, and so, you know, in my nature, I try and see the best in situations and see the best in people. And uh, I try and have, you know, in business life, I try and have empathy for, you know, a client or a client contact that's given us hell. Um, mm -hmm. I try and have empathy for their situation. And, you know, whether it's a shareholder meeting or what their boss is asking of them or, you know, I try and uh, talk through with my people, like the reasons why they said something like that and the pressures that they're under, uh, I feel like that helps us, you know, helps us deal with uh, yeah, when, when stuff gets out of whack. 
being being able to put yourself into other people's shoes makes things much easier, right? Then yeah, yeah. I mean, and and you know, I don't. Um, I wish that was like an epiphany we could stamp out on this podcast. I mean, that's it's good advice for uh, anybody in life in any situation. Um, but making sure to re- like reminding yourself about that in business because it's it's easy to let the emotions take over and uh, and let the panic set in. You know, every time there's a client at risk, you know, I've I- got. Every client is always at risk, you know, just yeah, reminding absolutely. people that yeah. like we're, you know, CMO, like marketing agencies exist so that CMOs can buy another six months by firing <laughs> their agency before they move on to their next gig. Like that's, it's that's the awesome nature of the, course. it's the nature of the business that we're in. So like, uh, <laughs> yes, everything is always at risk. So know that and, uh, you know, it's, it, no, it's it good, good alleviates some of the gravity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, w- I don't know if I told you this on, on the last one. I mentioned this a few times on this podcast. When my daughter was born, I went through the toughest time of my life where um, first my daughter was born, which was awesome, but I would had business was going really well. So I was very busy and then adding a kid to it. You know, you, you know how this, I don't have to tell you anything, not sleeping, etc. cetera. And um, two weeks after my daughter was born, my mother passed away and then my wife had unclear abdominal pain, like very, very severe. So she needed two surgeries to get this fixed. And once this was done, my grandma passed away. So it was like really this crazy, crazy storm of events. And um, I was, I, I'm also, I know I'm built for dealing with this stuff. It always came to me very, very natural. And, um, you know, an employee of mine, a friend of mine came to me and said, hey man, how are you doing this? How can you still perform? How can you still be happy? How can you still smile? How, why don't you break down with so much going on in your life? I'm like, I had I didn't know what what to answer. I mean, he said, "Please think about it and let me know." And I came up with two things. The first thing is that I'm very good at accepting things. It doesn't matter how bad it is. If you can accept things, you take all this chatter away in your head, you know. And then when once you accept something, you can act. Otherwise, you just react. That's yeah. the and the serenity prayer. Give me the serenity to accept things I cannot change. The um, the the power to change things I can and the wisdom to know which one's which type of thing. This is something I've, I've really internalized over the years of being an entrepreneur because you always have to deal with the problems. If everything's running smooth, then people leave you alone. But if there's problems, you have to, <laughs> right? yeah. you have to jump in. So that's, that's the first thing that really made, it, made a giant impact in my life. And the second thing is I have this gratitude rock that I pick up every morning and I go through the things I'm grateful for, which brings me to an all is well state of mind. And I... You know, often we get consumed by the the problem of the day, you know, because there's always a big problem. And when you just focus on this problem, then you likely forget all the positive things that you have in your life. You know, like your healthy body, your family's healthy, you have your family, you have your business, you have your friends, like yada, 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 very long list. And the yeah. big problem that you focus on most likely is going to be... Uh, um, you will not even remember it in, in two weeks from now. Right. So, yeah. So I was, I was, you can see me on video yeah. lean, leaning over. I, there, we have a saying on the wall. Um, when you focus on problems, you get more problems. You know, when you focus on solutions or, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's true. You know, it's, uh, um, the appreciative inquiry, um, that, that process, uh, of, you know, visualizing, um, you know, visualizing the positive outcome and then talking about how you got there Mm -hmm. uh, versus, you know, and that's something we have a tendency as entrepreneurs or even in relationships of like, these are all our problems. Like, let's fix this. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, when you're, when you are focused on problems and fixing problems and uh, as opposed to what's good, what's good about this, what's great about this, how do we make more of that? You know, when, when, you know, with, within your relationships, you know, when you're at your best together, what was, what was the situation and why was that so awesome? Mm -hmm. Um, Talking, talking that way, focusing on the, um, and it's not just, it's not about like forgetting that there are problems or overshadowing it, but, you know, certifiably, like psychologically, as you're focused on positive things, you have more positive outcomes. Yep. And I'm, I'm even, even this sounds a little crazy, but I'm even appreciating I actually like to have problems because like this problem always is like a, um, how do you call this? Like a stepping stone to making things so much better. You know, like it's, if you can turn problems into positive outcomes, 
you know, like, oh, you can see the positive things in, in, in problems. For example, we, we've been hacked a few years ago at MaxCDN. And, um, you know, it was pretty stressful. We could have lost everything, but, you know, we just accepted it, say, okay, this is what it is. And we plowed through it and we developed so many tools that protected us and our clients from, you know, from, from being hacked that we had an advantage in the market and we sold a lot of accounts because we had this feature set built, you know? So if you, if you do things right and, you know, you are solution oriented and you fix things and you, you know, then problems can always make you, make you stronger. A, fr a friend of mine said this really well. He said, um, we all go through fire. We all have, you know, we all have, have, have problems. If you um, consider yourself as wood, then you burn down to ashes. If you consider yourself as precious metal and you just get refined from all these hard things that you go through. So um, even though it sounds a little crazy, but I, I welcome having problems. <laughs> Uh, I got plenty I can give you. Let's uh, <laughs> let's talk after the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you're running low. No, I'm 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 good. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. I just tried. Still. <laughs> <laughs> but but trying. I I know everybody with it. Um, I want to eliminate the word "try" from the, from the English or from from any language. I think trying should only be used if like, oh, let me try this cake or something like this. But, yeah, I think trying is the most inefficient way not to do something. Either you do it or you don't. You know, even Yoda said, "Do or do not." There is no try. So I'm, I'm like really crazy on not using this. Also, from an NLP standpoint, neurolinguistic neuro -linguistic programming, you program yourself with your language. And if you try something, you set yourself up for failure. Versus if you do something, you just like you know, you, you go all in and. And do it. So I will. If, if you use the word "try" again on this podcast, I will raise my finger. <laughs> All right, I like it. <laughs> um, this is really cool. Thank you very much for all the insights. Um, I always wrap things up with a um, question about books. What are the books that had the biggest impact in your life? Certainly. Um, so I've, I'm staring at a couple right now. I actually just moved all my books right next to my desk, so this is helpful. Um, so I, I got a few that I can name that uh, I think had the most, uh, I guess, has most shaped me as an entrepreneur in our company. And um, I got um, I gotta give mad props to my partner uh, at BFO, Steve Kroll, my work wife, mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for kind of pushing me down this path. Uh, Small Giants, a book by Bo Burlingham, uh, I was one of the chief editors for Inc. Um, and it was, it's, uh, there's a community that spawned out of that, uh, very similar to Conscious Capitalism, who I'm also involved with. Uh, you know, a, a, a book about business <laughs> that spawned a movement. Um, you know, with Small Giants, it's all about building great companies that aren't just out to be big. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, that was an awakening for us to focus on. And we're, we're still growing. I don't, um, I don't have to stay small, but I, we're not, we don't want to grow too fast and we don't want to get big just for the sake of getting big. Um, so it's a great, a lot of great ideas there around focusing on what makes you best and, uh, and what makes you happy. You know, I, I talked to a lot of, uh, a lot of folks in the agency world who have gone big and scaled down and, um, they've got this, this smile on their face and, you know, I'm, I kudos to you. Like they're, you know, they don't need, a hundred clients like they want to do their best work and scale back and 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 not have a giant payroll to deal with like that's uh, i got mad mad props for anybody that uh that focuses on building a great company and and being happy and having the balance that they want um another another book to recommend i would say the great game of business we already kind of talked about that and and open book management and what that's uh what that's meant for our uh our company um so those would be the uh, those would be the two on my list that I think has shaped uh, shaped me as an entrepreneur the most. Um, talking about conscious capitalism, can you explain what it is? It has come up a few times and on, on the show. Yeah. Um, so it is a well. It originally, it was a book written by John Mackey, the founder of Whole Foods, and Raj Sisodian, uh, professor of uh, a business at uh, Babson, and there's a, a lot more on his resume. Um, and it's all about elevating humanity through business. Uh, it's about operating business businesses uh, on behalf of all stakeholders, not just maximizing shareholder values. Mm -hmm. uh, so stakeholders being employees, being your supply chain, your customers, uh, and how that, you know, that value system when 
uh, businesses serving all of those uh, all of those masters. The, the business is more successful, more long term. Like there's, um, I, I think a lot of the things I'm involved with can sound kind of hippy dippy, and it's not. Like it's capitalism. You know, mm-hmm. when you're when you're a company that takes care of your people and uh, and you know and your supply chain, all of that. I, I mean, I, I don't have a supply chain, but uh, you perform better and you have better long-term prospects. Um, I've talked to a lot of people in that space who focus on impact investing, uh, using some of the tenets of conscious capitalism as a, as a guide for, you know, to which businesses are actually doing great things and uh, versus the ones that, you know, greenwash and sponsor a small charity and advertise the heck out of it. Um, but are really, <laughs> but are really just corporate, you know, uh, filled with corporate greed. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's a great community of businesses uh, that I think are drinking the same Kool-Aid that I am. So the relationships that I've fostered there and talking to other CEOs and owners that believe the same things. And, you know, I, I learned a ton about uh, from a catering company in the Chicago suburbs, Tom, Tom Walter and the great folks at Tasty Catering. Um, it, it was a little tough at first, you know, I'm, I went into the room thinking these guys don't do anything that we do. I run a digital marketing firm with millennials. Uh, They've got cooks and drivers and all sorts of other stuff, but you know, learning from other companies that believe in the same things and taking those learnings and applying it to your own. There's, there's just a, a lot of value I found in that, you know, getting out of, getting out of the bubble of digital marketing um, and talking to other businesses with many different challenges, it, you know, breaks you outside of that mold of thinking about the same things every day. And mm-hmm. it's where a lot of great, great ideas come from. That's awesome. It's, I, I'm, I firmly believe in this. Even the, my old business partner is very successful with stocks and, uh, you know, he, he bought in, he bought like when oil dropped so much, he bought a lot of, bought a lot of oil and, he told me like, Hey man, you're definitely going to make money on this, but I'm, I'm very hippie as well. And I rather poured my money into Tesla because I just, I believe in this, that, you know, this will have a positive impact in the world versus oil. Right. And, um, thank God Tesla was, was doing good as well, but yeah, I'm, I'm a firm believer in just like, you know, voting with your money. It's like an important thing to do. And I really love this concept to yeah. do, do good with your business and treat people right. My, my parents were hippies. I guess that's where this is coming from. I, <laughs> <laughs> I believe in it as well. Yeah, no, it's uh, um, I, I think hippies got a lot of get a lot of things right. Um, yeah. you know, it's all about balancing and uh, you know, taking the um, I don't know, you you care, you know, taking things you care about and applying that in business that uh, that leads to good things. Mm-hmm. Well then, this was really awesome and insightful. Thank you very much for for coming on a second time. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate chatting with you, and it was very valuable for me. And um, I'm very sure it's going to be valuable for the audience as well. So, again, absolutely. Thanks for having me on, and uh, to the folks listening out there, uh, if you made it this far, thanks. Uh, thanks for listening, and I'm uh, I, I'm I'm happy to jam with other folks and. Um, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, Twitter. I can, I can be found online. It's not just a clever name. Um, so please, please reach out. I love, uh, love talking shop. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for having me.